Pirkei Avot, Perik Aleph, Mishnah Aleph. So the last share that we had on Pirkei Avot was purely an introduction, Kol Yisrael. Now we're going to talk about uh, Moshe Kibal Torah Misinai. So the first Mishnah in Pirkei Avot, Perik 1, Perik Aleph, Mishnah Aleph, Moshe Kibal Torah Misinai. Moses received the Torah from Mount Sinai. We began talking about that in the last year. I want to continue. And what happened to the Torah that Moses got from Shomayim, from Hashem? We know that we know that Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, was uh, at the top of Mount Sinai, not once but twice, for 40 days and 40 nights. And that he received the Torah directly from God. And that the Torah that he received from God, he delivered directly to the Jewish nation. He presided over the religious affairs of the Jewish nation for the 40 years thereafter. Moshe Rabbeinu is considered the foundational figure of Judaism. That is why he is referred to uniquely among all the leaders of Jewish history as Rabbeinu, as our teacher. Because everything that we have in terms of Judaism was received from Moses. And yet, although he is the platform for Judaism, and he is the foundational figure in terms of Jewish knowledge and the practice of Jewish law, at the same time, he is seen only as a number one figure. And there's number twos and number threes and number fours that follow on from him. And in Pirkei Avot, what the Tanaim, what the rabbis who composed Pirkei Avot wished to convey is that Judaism doesn't have one primary source to the exclusion of all others. And that although we have the ultimate respect for Moshe Rabbeinu as the original source of the Torah, the Torah evolves and develops from the time of Moshe Rabbeinu through a system known as Masorah. What is the system that we call Masorah? Transmission. That's the best translation of the word Masorah. We transmit the Torah from one generation to the next. And there is this famous story in the Talmud. And it's, it's a type of story which is typical of the Talmud in its very fanciful nature. Moshe Rabbeinu is somehow transported to the base medrash of Rabbi Akiva, who is one of the foundational figures of the Mishnah, of Torah Shabbat al when it was finally put into words and, trans and into a form that could be transmitted in writing in a literary form for future generations. Rabbi Akiva, whose principal Talmud, as far as the Talmud is concerned, is Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Meir's Talmud was Rebbe, Rabbi Yehuda Hanossi. Rabbi Yehuda Hanossi was the editor of the Mishnah. We say Stam Mishnaka Rabbi Meir. Whenever we don't have a name that is ascribed to a particular halakha that appears in the Mishnah, that halakha can automatically be assumed to have been a halakha of Rabbi Meir. We don't need to ascribe a name because Rabbi Meir was the Rebbe of Rabbi Yehuda Hanossi. Who was Rabbi Meir's Rebbe? Originally, it was Reb Elisha or Elisha ben Avuya. Elisha ben Avuya is an interesting figure. We'll come to him in a minute. Elisha ben Avuya was uh, his original teacher, but ultimately his teacher was the great Rabbi Akiva. So when we say Stam Mishnah Reb Meir, what we are really saying is that the essence of our Jewish faith as we practice it today was conveyed to us through a medium called Rabbi Akiva. And Rabbi Akiva, who was a Baal Tshuva, he only began the study of Torah. He wanted to marry the daughter of Kalba Savua at the age of 40. And he became a Talmud scholar. And now we're in the midst of Sefirah Saomer, when we commemorate the death of 24,000 Talmidim of Rabbi Akiva. He was one of the greatest Jewish teachers, even though he's not known as Akiva Rabbeinu. Perhaps... We should understand him as the foundational figure of Torah Shabbat Al-Peh. If Moshe Rabbeinu is the foundational figure 
of Torah Shebikhtav, of the written law. Then Rabbi Akiva is the foundational figure of Torah Shebaal Peh, of the oral law, that was ultimately put into writing by Rabbi Yehuda Hanossi, the Talmud of his Talmud, Rabbi Meir. So, just, that's just a, uh, uh, by way of background, because I need, to under, I need to explain to you, I need you to understand the concept of Masorah, which is the Jewish law is given from one generation to the next, and we have, in essence, a certain element of independence in the way that we adapt in our times to the existence of Jewish law and to that which came before us. Moshe Rabbeinu is transported in this fanciful story of the Talmud to the base medrash of Rabbi Akiva. And he complains that he can't understand anything that Rabbi Akiva is saying. What is Rabbi Akiva teaching to his students? And God reassures him and says that the Torah that you received at Mount Sinai is the same Torah that is being conveyed by Rabbi Akiva to his students. And my friends, the Torah that I am teaching you today via this Zoom and on this YouTube video is the very same Torah that was received by Moshe Rabbeinu at Mount Sinai from God, transmitted, and we're going to see in a moment, the method of transmission via many generations through to Rabbi Akiva and the Talmud on which we base our Jewish faith and Jewish practice. And ultimately, wherever we may be, I'm here in Beverly Hills, you are wherever you are, whether you are on the east coast of the United States, you're in Eretz Israel, you're in the United Kingdom, or wherever else my listeners and viewers are across the Jewish world. We are studying the very same Torah and practicing the very same mitzvahs that were originally given to Moshe Rabbeinu, and when the Mishneh Navot, Perik Aleph, Mishneh Aleph begins with Moshe Kibel Torah Misinai, we can say, I can say, Pini Kibel Torah Misinai. It may have come through many different generations of people who transmitted it through to me, but ultimately the very same Torah that was received by Moses at Mount Sinai is the same Torah that we are studying now via the medium of Zoom and YouTube. Moshe Kibel Torah Misinai. Umasora, see that word, Masora. Lehoishua. He gave it to Joshua. That which he received, he gave to Joshua. And, and there's, there's a tension here, dynamic, that is important to describe and discuss. On the one hand, we will never, in human history, experience the level of sanctity and sacredness and holiness that was experienced by the Jews at the foot of Mount Sinai. It is not possible for us to receive the Torah at that level of spirituality ever again. And therefore, there's a reverence in which we hold our forebears in terms of the Masorah. Moshe Rabbeinu is considered to have achieved a certain level of sacredness, sanctity, holiness, spirituality that could never be achieved by his primary student and disciple, Yehoshua bin Nun. Nevertheless, at the very same time, there is an evolution of Torah. The very same Torah that Moshe received wasn't the Torah, as we just heard, that was taught by Rabbi Akiva to his students. How is that possible? Because... The holiness may to a certain degree ebb and decline, but at the very same time, the knowledge has to evolve and the practice has to evolve as a result of the conditions of the time and the situation that we may exist in at the particular moment in which the Torah is being practiced and decided upon. And therefore... Although Rabbi Akiva and Chazal came up with many concepts that perhaps didn't exist in the Torah of Mount Sinai, all, they can all find their basis in the Masorah, in the transmission of the Masorah from Mount Sinai, 
even if they are somewhat un- unfamiliar to Moshe Rabbeinu. And in terms of the story that we heard about Moshe Rabbeinu sitting at the back of the base medrash of Rabbi Akiva, we can understand that he may not have fully appreciated every aspect of the Torah that was being taught by Rabbi Akiva. But as long as it finds its roots, its origins, its foundation in Moshe Rabbeinu, that Torah which was given by Moshe Rabbeinu to Yehoshua finds its full expression in Yehoshua bin Nun and to all those that followed him. Now, the whole purpose of the Pirkei Avot, or at least this initial part of Pirkei Avot, is not, as it were, to give you a historical account of all the different people who can be named in terms of the Masorah from Moshe Rabbeinu to Chazal. Who are Chazal? Chazal are the foundational figures of the Talmud of Torah Shabbat Peh during the Second Temple period. But of course the Torah pre-existed them. The practice of Torah has nothing whatsoever to do with Chazal in particular. Of course, they propagated it. But why we focus on Chazal is because when we began to record the Talmud in writing, it simultaneously became important to record who it was that received the Torah from whom so that we know that Chazal are authentic inheritors. They are authentic in terms of their ability to convey and deliver the Torah to us. Chazal, being the first generation or the first era of rabbinic figures who began to record the Torah in writing, are so important in terms of who we are as Jews. And that is why Pirkei Avot is not so concerned with the earliest generations of the Masorah, because one automatically assumes, one has to assume, and everybody assumed, that those generations through which the Torah was transmitted between Moshe Rabbeinu and ultimately the first rabbinic figures of Chazal, that they are untainted in terms of their Torah commitment, in terms of their ability to transmit that which they received to the next generation. And it was only when the concept of Torah Sheba al that oral law, was challenged by the Sadducees, by the Tzidukim, that it became important to establish this concept of rabbinic transmission, of this Masorah, that we are the inheritors, we are those who have received that which has been transmitted to us through earlier generations so that we can transmit it further. What the Tzidukim wanted to say is, we do away with anything that was agreed or that was practiced in earlier generations, we can go back to the original text and we can transmit Torah from Torah Shebichsav. And Chazal wanted to establish as a matter of principle, that the Jewish faith is not something that transcends history, that the Jewish faith is dependent and contingent on history, and that history is represented by the generations of Chazal, of those original figures of the Talmud, who began to record the principles of Jewish law in the face of opposition from those who said, It's time to do away with customs and practices that don't find, as it were, a full scriptural source in Jewish scripture and therefore can be discarded in the favor of a more literal understanding of the words of the Torah of Tanakh. And Chazal wanted to establish a principle that everything that we have is based on scripture through interpretation and through a system that we call Talmud that was initially conveyed to us in the Mishnah and ultimately expanded upon in the Talmud and when we practice the laws of the Shulchan Aruch and when we decide upon Jewish law we base it on tradition through the eyes of those who are aware of contemporary circumstances. 
so that there's no such thing as any Jewish law which is independent of the past and there's no such thing as the past without it being interpreted in terms of the present. So that is the initial concept that is conveyed to us by Pirkei Avot and it begins with Mishnah Aleph of Perik Aleph of Ovis. That Moshe Rabbeinu gave the Torah that he received at Mount Sinai, he delivered it to Yehoshua, his primary Talmud, Talmud, and that Yehoshua took it from him, and even though he was not Moshe Rabbeinu, and he was never going to be Moshe Rabbeinu, he couldn't be Moshe Rabbeinu. And yet we know that he was able to receive what he heard from Moshe Rabbeinu and convey it to the next generation, and that is what the Mishnah tells us. The Yehoshua Lizakanim. The Zakanim are not named. We know that there were 70 Zakanim at the time of Moshe Rabbeinu. He was the 71st. We know it from a story of Eldod and Medod. They were considered both elders of the Jewish law and prophets of the Jewish law. The Zakanim accompanied Yehoshua from the Midbar, from the wilderness, into Eretz Canaan in the conquest of the Promised Land. And when he died, they continued in that tradition. There is an alternative source of information with regard to everything that we're discussing. It's called Ovois de Rabbi Noson. Ovois de Rabbi Noson is another, it's an alternative version of Pirke Ovois, which is slightly expanded and gives extra inf information. It's a sort of Gemara on the Mishnah of Pirkei Avos. It's not included in the canon of the Talmud. The final redaction of the Talmud doesn't include Avos der Abnossen. However, we have Avos der Abnossen and it contains very useful and crucial information in the understanding of the transition of Jewish law and the transmission of Jewish law over the period of the Tanaim and, uh, and that initial period of the Talmud. So according to Avastar Ibn Nasan, from the Zakanim, there was Zakanim, it says here, Uzakanim Linaviim, Unaviim Asura, Masaruha L Anshe Knesa Sagdoila. So the Avastar Ibn Nasan expands on that slightly. I'm not going to go into those details right now, but you should know that there was a period of time when there was Shoiftim. And the Avastar Ibn Nasan takes them into account as well. Who were the Shoiftim? The judges. They were the leaders of the Jewish nation, and they were in parallel to the Zakanim. They weren't necessarily Nevi'im. But throughout the period of the second Beis Amikdosh, of the, sorry, of the first Beis Amikdosh, there were leaders whose function it was to receive the practice and the execution of Torah law from previous generations ensure its survival in their generation and present it and preserve it and retain it and sustain it for any future generation. That was their role. And ultimately, we come through to Shmuel Hanovi. Shmuel Hanovi was the ultimate prophet. We know that he is on a similar status to Moshe Rabbeinu in terms of him re-establishing the primacy of Torah, the primacy of Judaism in a nation that had become very nationalized and very parochial in the face of the challenges that they had to deal with. And Shmuel Hanovi dealt with the main issue of his day, which was the establishment of a monarchy. Initially, he appointed Shaul, who was the king, but he didn't retain the monarchy. He was from the tribe of Binyamin. Ultimately, the monarchy was given over to the royal tribe of, of, uh, of all the tribes that descended from Yaakov Avinu, the tribe of Judah. David, who was the son of Jesse of Yishai, becomes the king of the Jewish nation and the foundational figure of the Messianic dynasty. And we're going to talk about the Messianic dynasty during Shavuos, when we read Megillas Rus. Ultimately, when we wait for Mashiach, we're waiting for a Mashiach, a savior, a messianic figure that is descended from the house of David. And the house of David was associated and strongly 
connected with the Masora. However, they are not mentioned in Ovis de Reb Nossen and not mentioned in Pirkei Ovis because the transmission of Jewish faith was not down to kings, wasn't down to political leaders, however holy and however special they were. And of course, part of Tanakh is Tehillim, which was written by David HaMelech. And part of Tanakh is Shir Hashirim and Koheles, which were written by his son Shlomo HaMelech. However, when it came to the transmission of Jewish law, they're not part of that. It is given to the Zakanim, to the elders, and then the Nevi'im, the prophets. They are the conscience of the Jewish nation. So now we come to the period of time after the destruction of the Beis HaMikdosh. The Nevi'im had predicted, the prophets had predicted that the temple would be destroyed and that ultimately it would no longer exist. And they went into a period, the Jewish nation went into a period of exile in Babylon, in Bovel, and then in Persia. But then Ezra and Nehemiah brought the Jewish nation back. And they discovered that much of the Jewish faith that all had taken for granted during the period of the first base Amikdash had disintegrated in the face of the exile. And they called together something which we call in Hebrew the Anshei Knesses Hagadoyla. The men of the great assembly, the original great synagogue of Judaism, which was a collection of 120 rabbis and spiritual figures and mentors, who established a very important principle, which is that Judaism cannot survive without faith practice and simply relying on a temple-centric Judaism would contribute to the demise of the Jewish faith. Each Jew, wherever they are, whether they are in Eretz Yisrael or Bavel or Persia or the United States or anywhere in the world, has to practice a Judaism that is a reflection of what it is that God wants from them. And the Anshei Knesset Agdoila were the original foundational figures of the Judaism with, with which we are so familiar because it is the Judaism of our day. And that's really what I want to focus on today, that the Anshei Knesset Agdoila were the group of people who created, for example, the idea that you need to daven Shemone Esrei the Amidah three times a day, Shachris, Mincha and Mariv. And they called the Anshei Knesses Agdoila. I'm going to read here from the Perush here in my beautiful Mishnais Masifta of Pirkei Ovis. Nikru u Anshei Knesses Agdoila. They are called the Anshei Knesses Agdoila. Al Shem Shehichziru Es HaTorah LeYoshna. It's a Gemara in Yuma. They returned the crown to its original place where it had originally lain. The crown of Judaism. The fact that Jews can be proud of their Judaism and retain their Judaism is only as a result, only took place as a result of the fact that Anshei Knesset Hagdola took the trouble to establish practices and rituals and customs which ensure our survival as Jews. And there they were, 2,500 years ago, concerned that you and me would still be Jews wherever we are. That is the power of the Anshei Knesset HaGdoyla. Shetiknu loimar bitfila shumene esrei hagodoyl hagibor vahanoira. How do we begin, Amida? We say, hokel hagodoyl hagibor vahanoira. The great God, Gibor, the strong one, the Hanura, and the, and the awesome one. And there was a time when God was not considered Gibor and was not considered Neira. And here we have it in the parish. It's based on a Gemara. And there are many Mepharshim that deal with this issue. Kefisha Oma Moshe Rabbeinu, ki Yirmi Daniel, tiknu shalayoimru Gibor v'Neira. Originally, Moshe Rabbeinu said, 
that God is Godol, great, Gibor is strong, and Nora awesome. But when it came to Jeremiah, and when it came to Daniel, Tiknushla Yomru Gibor Venora, they established that no one should refer to God, to, sorry, to God as Gibor or as Noira. She Yotan, Yirmiya said, how can we refer to God as being Gibor? Nochrim mekarkarin beicholoi aye noira oisov. The Gentiles have destroyed his sanctuary. Where exactly is the wonder of God? And therefore he established a practice that we shouldn't use the word noira as a descriptive adjective for God. And similarly Daniel also living in that exile period of Jewish history, Omar. Nochrim mishtabdim bevonov. There are outsiders, strangers, who are enslaving his children. Ayeg vuroisov, how exactly can he be considered to be mighty? Lochen tikken shalayomru gibor, and therefore he established the practice that we no longer refer to God using the adjective gibor. Until the members of the great assembly gathered together and they declared, Adarabba, on the contrary, Zuhi Giboras Gavurasai, Gavuras Gavurasai, Shekoivesh Yitrai. This indeed is the power of the Almighty. It is the ultimate expression of power. Shenoisein erech apayim l'rashoim, that he behaves patiently towards those who are wicked. He created a world of free choice. And rather than immediately respond to those who are wicked, so that no one would be, ever behave wickedly, he gave people the latitude to behave in a bad fashion. That is incredible strength of God. That Rishoyim can operate, that those who are wicked can do wicked things, and that there is no immediate reaction so that they can think that they can get away with it. That is the ultimate expression of power. Power is not always pouncing upon every situation and saying, I'm in charge. Power is sometimes being reserved and laid back and holding back so that things can happen and seeing how they turn out and ultimately being the decisor of history, which of course God is, but is, he has a light hand, a light touch. He's not somebody who is the determiner of history in any way that can be defined or described or determined just by observing history. Only in retrospect and after much time has passed can we look back and say, God determined history. The greatest strength of God is the fact that he is reserved in the face of the actions of those who can be considered wicked. And these are his wonders. Do you know what the greatest wonder of God is? It is the fact that despite the fact that the Jews are the weakest nation on earth that we have endured for more than 3,300 years, since the exodus from Egypt, our demise has been predicted by each and every mighty power and world power that has ever prevailed over human history. We have outsurvived them. That said, the Ansheik Nesses Hagdoila is the greatest Neira of all. That is the greatest wonder of all. And while Doniel and Yirmiya may have doubted the Neira and the Gibor of Hashem, the Ansheik Nesses Hagdoila said that it is his abstention from intervention that really gives us an understanding of the Gibor and the Neira of Hashem. And therefore, they establish that in Shmona Esrei, we continue to say, Hakel, Hagodoil, Hagibair.
Vahanoira. I have a question for you, and I'm going to leave you with this cliffhanger. If it's true to say that the Anshe Knesset Sagdoila re-established the concept of Gibor and Noira and reintroduced it into Shmona Esrei, why are they called the Anshe Knesset Sagdoila? They should be called the Anshe Knesset Hagibor Vahanoira. Because Godol never left Shmona Esrei. Gibor and Noira left Shmona Esrei. So why would you call them the Anshe Knesset Hagdoila? Godol is the one word that was left in. It's Gibor and Noira which were the words that were taken out. In the next Pirke Ovois podcast, I will address this question as I continue on our journey. Understanding the incredible transmission of Jewish law, Jewish faith, Jewish identity, and Judaism through the many generations of Jewish leadership and Jewish spiritual mentors that we have recorded here at the beginning of Pirkei Avot. Thank you so much for listening and thank you so much for participating in this year on Pirkei Avot. We will continue in Mishnah Aleph of Perik Aleph in the next podcast. Thank you.